Hi, friends. We're at chapter 13 of Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Let's hop in. <clears throat> Brian stood at the end of the long part of the L of the lake and watched the water, smelled the water, listened to the water. It was the water. <laughs> A fish moved and his eyes jerked sideways to see the ripples, but he did not move any other part of his body and did not raise the bow or reach into his his uh, pouch for a fish arrow. It was not the right kind of fish, not a fish, a food fish. The food fish stayed close in the shallows and did not roll that way, but made quicker movements, food movements. The large fish rolled and stayed deep and could not be taken, but it didn't matter. This day, this morning, he was not looking for fish. Fish was the light meat and he was sick of them. He was looking for one of the foolish birds he called them fool birds, and there was a flock that lived near the end of the long part of the lake. But something he did not understand had stopped him, and he stood, breathing gently through his mouth to keep silent, letting his eyes and his ears, ears go out to do the work for him. It happened this way. <clears throat> it happened before this way. Something had come into him from outside to warn him, and he had stopped. Once it had been a bear, the bear again. He had been taking the last of the raspberries and something came inside and stopped him. And when he looked where his ears said to look, there was a female bear with cubs. He had taken two more steps. He would have come between the mother and her cubs. And that was a bad place to be. As it was, the mother had stood and faced him and made a sound low in her throat to threaten and warn him. He paid attention to the feeling now. He stood and waited patiently, knowing he was right and that something would come. Turn, smell, listen, feel, and then a sound, a small sound. He looked up and away from the lake and saw the wolf. It was halfway up the hill from the lake, standing with its head and shoulders sticking out into a small opening, looking down on him with wide yellow eyes. He had never seen a wolf in the size through him. Not as big as a bear, but something, but somehow seeming that large. The wolf claimed all that was below him as his own and took Brian as his own. Brian looked back for a moment and felt afraid because the, the wolf was so, so right. He knew Brian, knew him and owned him, and chose not to do anything to him. But the fear moved in, moved away, and Brian knew the, the wolf for what it was, another part of the woods, another part of all of it. Brian relaxed, the tension on the spear in his hand, and settled the bow in his other hand from where it had started up, started to come up, sorry. He knew the wolf now, as the wolf knew him, and he nodded to it, nodded and smiled. The wolf watched him for, an, for another time, another part of his life, and then it turned and walked effortlessly up the hill and came out of the brush, the bush. It was followed by three other wolves, all equally large and gray and beautiful, looking down on him as they trotted past and away. Brian nodded to each of them. He was not the same now. The Brian that stood and watched the wolves move away and nodded to them was completely changed. Time had come, time that measured but didn't care about. Time had come into his life and moved out and left him different. In measured time, 47 days had passed since the crash. 42 days, he thought, since he had died and been born the new Brian. When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down gutted him, and dropped him and left him with nothing. The rest of that first day, he had gone down and down until dark. He had let the fire go out and had forgotten to even eat an egg. He had let his brain take him down to where he was done, and he wanted to be done and done, <clears throat> to where he wanted to die. He had settled into the gray funk deeper still until finally in the dark, he had gone up on the ridge and taken the hatchet and tried to end it by cutting himself. Madness. A hissing madness that took his brain. There had been nothing for him then, and he tried to become nothing by cutting. But the cutting had been hard to do, impossible to do. And he had at least fallen to his side, wishing for death, wishing for an end, and slept. Only he didn't sleep. His eyes closed and his mind open. He laid on the rock through the night, laid and hated and wished for it to end, and thought of the word cloud down plowed down through that awful night, over and over the word, wanting all his clouds to come down, 
but in the morning he was still there still there on his side and the sun came up when he opened his eyes he saw the cuts on his arm the dry blood turning black he saw the blood and hated the blood hated what he had done to himself and when he was the old brian and was weak two things came to his mind two true things he was not the same the plain passing changed him the disappointment cut him down and made him new he was not the same and would never be again like he had been that was one of the true things the new things and the other one was that he would not die he would not let death in again he was new of course he had made a lot of mistakes he smiled now walking up to the lake shore after the wolves were gone thinking of the early mistakes the mistakes that he realized that he had to find new ways to be what he had to become he had to make a new fire which he now kept going using partially rotten wood because the punky wood would smolder for many hours and still come back with fire. But that had been the extent of doing the right things for a while. His first bow was a disaster that almost blinded him. He sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. Then he had spent two days making arrows. The shafts were willow, straight with the bark peeled. He fire hardened the points and a split couple of them to make forked points as he had done with the spear he had no feathers so he just left them bare and fi figuring for the fish they only had to travel a few inches he had no strings and he threw uh, that threw him until he looked down at his tennis shoes they had long laces too long he found that one lace cut in half would take care of both shoes and that that left the other lace for a bowstring. string all seemed to be going well until he tried to take a test shot he put an arrow into the string, pulled it back to his cheek, pointed it at a dirt hammock, and the and at that precise instant, the bow wood exploded in his hand, sending splinters and chips of wood into his face. Two, pe two pieces actually stuck into his forehead just above his eyes. If they had only been slightly lower, it would have blinded him. Two stiff mistakes. In his mental journal, he listed them to tell his father all the mistakes. He had made a new bow with slender limbs and more fluid, gentle pull, but could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was, in the end, surrounded by a virtual cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He would pull the bow back and set the arrow just above the water, and when the fish was no more than an inch, inch away, he would release the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him that the arrow had gone right through the fish again and again, but the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he... After hours, he struck the arrow down in the water, pulled the bow, and waited for a fish to come close. While he waited, he noticed that the water seemed to make the arrow bend or break in the middle. Of course, he forgotten that water reflect, reflect, refracts, goodness, sorry, and bends the light. He learned that somewhere in some class. Maybe it was biology. He couldn't remember. But it did bend the light. And that meant the fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below which meant he had to aim just under them. He would not forget his first hit, not ever. A round-shaped fish with golden sides, gold, sides as gold as the sun, stopped in front of the arrow. He aimed just beneath it, at the bottom edge of the fish, and released the arrow, and there was a bright flurry, a splash of gold in the water, and he grabbed the arrow and raised it up, and the fish was on the end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling, held it and looked it up at the sky, and he could feel his throat tighten and swell and filled with pride at what he had done. He had done food. With his bow and arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food and found a way to live. The bow had given him this way, and he ex exulted in it. The bow, the arrow, and the fish, and the hatchet, and the sky— he stood and walked from the water, still holding the fish and the arrow and the bow against the, so the sky, seeing them as they fit in his arms, as they were a part of him. He had food. He cut a green willow fork and held the fish over the fire until the skin crackled and peeled away. Then the meat inside was flaky, moist, and tender. He picked it off carefully with his fingers, tasting every piece mashing them in his mouth with his tongue to get the juices out of them. Hot, steaming pieces of fish. He could not, he thought, 
ever get enough. And that day, the first day, the first new day, he spent going to the lake, shooting a fish, taking it back to the fire, cooking it, eating it, then back to the lake, shooting a fish, cooking and eating it, on and on that way until dark. He had taken the scraps back to the water with the thought that they might work for bait and other fish came by the hundreds to clean them up. It would take, he could take his pick of them like a store, he thought, just like a store. And he could not remember later how many he ate that day, but he thought it must have been over 20. It had been a feast day, his first feast day, in celebration of being alive in the new way he had of getting food. By the end of that day, it became dark, and he lay next to the fire with his stomach full of fish and grease from the meat smeared around his mouth. He could feel a new hope building in him. Not hope that he would be rescued, that was gone. But hope in his knowledge, hope in the fact that he could learn to survive and take care of himself. Tough hope, he thought that night. I'm full of tough hope. 14. Mistakes. Small mistakes could turn into disasters. Little funny mistakes could snowball so that while you were still smiling at the humor, you could find yourself looking at death. In the city, he made a mistake. Usually there was a way to rectify it, to make it all right. If he fell on his bike and sprained his leg, he could wait for it to heal. If he forgot something at the store, he could find another other food in the refrigerator. Now it was different. Shh. And also quick. Also incredibly quick. If he sprained his leg here, he might starve before he could get around. Oh my Lord, Kaiser. Sorry. <laughs> um, if he sprained his leg here, he might starve before he could get around again. If he missed while he was hunting or if the fish moved away, he might starve. If he got sick, really sick, so he couldn't move, he might starve. So sorry. Kaiser. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Mistakes. Early in the new time, he had learned to uh, learn the most important thing, the truly vital knowledge that drives all creatures in the forest. Food is all. Food was simply everything. All things in the woods, from the insects to the fish to the bears, were always, always, always looking for food. It was a great, it was the great and single driving influence in nature to eat. All must eat. By the way he learned it, it almost killed him. His second new night, stomach full of fish and fire smoldering in the shelter, he had been sound asleep when something, he thought later it might be the smell that had awakened him. Near the fire, completely unafraid of the smoking coals and completely unafraid of Brian, a skunk, was digging where he had buried the eggs. There was some sliver of a moon, and in the faint pearl light, he could see the bushy tail with the white stripes down his back. He had nearly smiled. He did not know how the skunk had found the egg. Some smell, perhaps, some tiny fragment of a shell um, had left a smell, but it looked almost cute, like its little head was down and its little tail was up as it dug, kicking sand back. But those were his eggs and not the skunk's. And half smile had quickly been replaced with fear that would lose his food, and he grabbed a handful of sand and thrown it at the skunk. Get out of here. He was going to say more silly human words, but in less than half a second, the skunk had snapped its rear end up, curved its tail over, and sprayed Brian with a direct shot aimed at his head from less than four feet away. In tiny confines of the shelter, the effects were devastating. The thick, sulfurous, rotten odor filled the small room, hev heavy, ugly, and stinging. The corrosive spray hit his face and smeared into his lungs and eyes, blinding him. He screamed and threw himself sideways, taking the entire wall off the shelter, screamed and clawed out of the shelter, and fell, ran to the shore of the lake, stumbling and tripping, he scrambled into the water and slammed his head back and forth, trying to wash his eyes, slashing the water to clear his eyes. A hundred funny cartoons had um, he had seen about skunks. Cute cartoons about the smell of skunks. Cartoons that laugh at and joke about. But when the spray hit there, was nothing funny about it. He was completely blind for almost two hours. A lifetime. He thought he might be permanently blind or at least impaired, and that would have been the end. 
as it was the pain in his eyes that lasted for days, bothered him after that for at least two weeks. The smell in the shelter, in his clothes, and his hair was still there now. Almost a month and a half later, he nearly smiled. Mistakes. Food had to be protected. While he was in the lake, trying to clear his eyes, the skunk went ahead and dug up the rest of the turtle eggs and ate every one. Licked all the shells clean, and he could have cared less that Brian was thrashing around in the water like a dying carp. The skunk had found food, and it was taking it. Brian was paying for a lesson. Protect food and have good shelter. Not a shelter to keep the wind and rain out, but a shelter to protect, a shelter to make him safe. The day after the skunk had set about making a good place to live, I'm sorry, the day after the skunk, he had said about making a good place to live. The basic idea had been good. The place of for his shelter was right, but he just haven't, hadn't gone far enough. He'd been lazy, but now he knew the second most important thing about nature, what drives nature. Food was first, but the work for food went on and on. Nothing in nature was lazy. He tried to take a shortcut and paid for it with his turtle legs, which he had come, which had come like more, uh, which he had come to like more than chicken eggs from the store. They had been fuller now somehow and had more depth to them. He set about improving his shelter by tearing it down. From dead pines up the hill, he brought down heavier logs and fastened several of them across the opening, wedging them at the top and burying the bottoms in the sand. Then he wove long branches in the same uh, through them to make a truly tight wall. And still not satisfied, he took thinner branches and wove those into the first weave. When he was finished, he could not find a place um, to put his fist through. It held together like a stiff woven basket. He judged the door opening to be the weakest spot. And here he took special time to weave a door of willows in so tight a mesh that no matter how a skunk tried or a porcupine, he thought, looking at the marks on his legs, it could not possibly get through. It had no He had no hinges, but arranged some cut off limbs at the top of the right in a way he had a method to hook the door in place. And when he was in, the door was hung he felt relatively safe a bear or something big could not get in by tearing at it but nothing small could bother him and the weave of the structure still allowed the smoke to filter up through the top and out all in all it took him three days to make the shelter stopping to shoot fish and eat as he went bathing four times a day trying to get the smell of the skunk to leave when his house was done, finally done right, he turned uh, to the constant problem, food. Um, it was all right to hunt and eat. I'm sorry. It was all right to hunt and eat or fish and eat. But what can happen if he had to go for a long time without food? What happened when the berries were gone and he got sick or hurt? Thinking of the skunk laid up temporarily or laid up temporarily. He needed a way to store food, to place a place to store it. He needed food to store. Mistakes. He tried to learn from the mistakes. He couldn't bury food again. Couldn't leave it in the shelter because something like a bear could get in it right away. It had to be high. High and safe. Above the door to the shelter, up on the rock face, about 10 feet, was a small ledge that he could make a natural storage place. Unreachable to animals. Except that it was unreachable to him as well. A ladder, of course. He needed a ladder. But he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on, and that, oh my gosh, your hair is getting in my nose. Sorry. But he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on, and that stopped him until he found a dead pine with many small branches sticking out. Using his hatchet, he chopped the branches off so they stuck out four or five inches up along the log. Then he cut the log off about 10 feet long and dragged it down to his shelter. It was a little heavy, but dry, and he could manage it. And when he propped it up, he found he could climb to the ledge with ease, though the tree did not roll from side to side a bit as he climbed. His food shelf, as he thought of it, had been covered with bird manure, and he carefully scraped it clean with sticks. He had never seen birds there, but that was probably because the smoke from his fire went straight across the opening, and they didn't like smoke. Still, he had leaned, he had learned and took time to weave a snug door for the small opening with green willows, cutting it so it jammed in tightly. 
and when he finished, he stood back and looked at the rock's face, his shelter below and the food shelf above, and allowed a small bit of pride to come in. Not bad, he thought. Not bad for someone who used to have trouble greasing the bearings on his own bicycle. Not bad at all. Mistakes. He had made a good shelter and food shelf, but he had no food except for fish and the last of the berries. And the fish, as good as they were, they still is good, I'm sorry, and the fish, as good as they still tasted then, were not something he could store. His mother had left some salmon out by mistake one time, and they went to an overnight trip to Cape Hesper to visit relatives. And when then they got back, the smell filled the whole house, and there was no way to store fish. At last, he thought, no way to store them dead. But he looked at the weave of his structure and thought, and a thought came to him. And he moved down to the water. <coughs> he had been putting the waste from the fish back into the water, and the food had attracted a hundred new ones. I wonder. They seemed to come easily to the food, at least the small ones. He had no trouble now shooting them, and had even speared one fish in his old fish spear now that he knew to aim low. He could dangle something in his fingers, and they came right up to it. It might be, a, it might be possible, he thought might be possible just to trap them, to make some kind of pond. To his right, the, the base of the rock bluff, there were pile, piles of smaller rocks that had fallen from the main chunk. Splinters and hunks from the double fist size of some large as, and some as large as his head. He spent an afternoon carrying rocks to the beach and making what amounted to a large pin for holding live fish. Two rock arms that stuck out 15 feet into the lake and curved together at the end. Where the arms came together, he left an opening about two feet across, and then he sat on the shore and waited. When he had started dropping the rocks, all the fish had darted away, but his fish trash pile of bones and skin and guts was in the pond area, and the prospect of food brought them back. Soon, in under an hour, there were 30 or 40 small fish in the enclosure, and Brian had made a gate by weaving small willows together into a fine mesh and closed them in. Fresh fish, he yelled. I have fresh fish for sale. Storing live fish to eat later had been a major breakthrough, he thought. I wasn't just keeping from starving. I was going to try to save ahead. Think ahead. Of course, he didn't know how he didn't know then how sick he would get of fish. <laughs>